If 2023 was the year of AI, then 2024 is the year of humanoid robots. This year, some of the most powerful entities in the world have made headlines for investing large sums of money into little-known startups, all developing bipedal robots. Robots that seem to already be walking and talking. You're welcome. If there's anything else you need help with, just let me know. So what's the game here? What are these mysterious companies working on these robots for? How were they able to get them to move like people so quickly? And what does this mean for the future of work? Boston Dynamics is probably the most well-known robotics company in the world. We've seen their parkour videos going viral for years, but they've also developed robots of all shapes and sizes to assist in what the robotics industry calls the three Ds. Dull, dirty, and dangerous. The closest model they ever produced to a humanoid robot is Atlas, which never really made sense for general purpose use due to its bulk and hydraulic design. But that's about to change. Boston Dynamics just announced Atlas V2, a stronger, slimmer, and more agile robot capable of exceeding a human's range of motion. The announcement of Atlas V2 comes three years after Hyundai's acquisition of Boston Dynamics. Hyundai plans on bringing Atlas into its manufacturing operations, and as you'll learn later in this video, they aren't the only auto manufacturer looking to integrate humanoid robots. While it's taken Boston Dynamics a decade to get to Atlas V2, a new crop of robotics companies had developed compact and capable robots seemingly overnight. The most high profile of these new robotics companies is Figure AI. Figure's general purpose robot called Figure One looks and moves like a human and can carry up to 44 pounds. But the thing that sets it apart from the other robots you'll see in this video is Figure's partnership with OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, which is what is powering the robot's ability to understand its environment and even carry out conversations. Can I have something to eat? Sure thing. Great. Can you explain why you did what you just did while you pick up this trash? On it. So I gave you the apple because it's the only uh, edible item I could provide you with from the table. If there's any part of you that's creeped out by the fact that these things move and talk like people, you have to understand that that's actually their most important feature. Designing these robots in the image of a human allows them to seamlessly integrate into our world and makes them interchangeable with human workers since there's no need to change the layout. Which is why Figure has already signed a deal with BMW to bring their robots to the assembly line, to handle tasks that are unsafe, repetitive, and challenging for humans. Later in the video, we're going to be diving deeper into exactly how these robots are trained and can even arrive for the first day of work already having full knowledge of the factory layout and how to do their job. While Figure's robots won't be integrating into any commercial spaces before 2025, one company already has robots in the testing phase at an Amazon warehouse. This is Digit from Agility Robotics. It's most likely the first humanoid robot that will have a hand in servicing everyday Americans through Amazon fulfillment centers. Digit can carry up to 40 pounds and has about the same reach of the average person. But something that sets Digit apart from the average human worker is Agility's cloud-based system called Agility Arc, which allows companies to control a fleet of Digit robots, all from a single computer. Through this tool, companies can assign tasks, schedule charging breaks, and even make adjustments on the fly. Currently, Digit is designed for repetitive, mundane tasks, like moving an empty bin from A to B. But long-term, Agility wants to expand Digit's capabilities to handle the least desirable jobs in a warehouse, which tend to be the jobs that put workers at risk of injury. The idea being that a group of digits would unload trucks overnight for the humans of the morning shift to carry out the next step in the process. Agility plans to begin manufacturing 10,000 robots a year at a brand new 70,000 square foot facility in Salem, Oregon. Now there's many more robots out there being developed by really impressive teams, but I'm only going to be highlighting one more in this video, and that's Apollo from Aptronic. Like the figure one, Apollo is an AI-based general purpose robot with a payload capacity of 55 pounds. 
It's powered by battery packs that can be hot swapped out for continuous operation. But the thing that sets Apollo apart for me personally is its design. Aptronic partnered with a design agency in Austin, Texas called Argo Design. There's an awesome video that I will link below on the Freethink YouTube channel where the actual design team explains their approach to Apollo. Is it mean looking? Is it happy looking? Kind of goofy? No, you don't want either one of those. You want this a kind of a, a positive, neutral disposition. There was a lot of work in the eyes and the mouth to find a balance that was doing the things that it needed to do uh, and making it uh, approachable without being too human to the point where you start to hit that uncanny valley issue. This is both charming and a little bit spooky. This is another good example of the subtlety of small changes though, because right. your initial version of this, the head was tilted just a little bit more and it was exponentially more frightening. Decades of Hollywood movies have conditioned us to assume the worst of technology in this form factor. So the challenge of designing something that appears friendly and approachable is paramount if these robots are going to live and work alongside humans. Over the next couple decades, we can imagine that there's going to be a lot of overlap between robots and humans working together. After all, we know that all it takes is one small bug in a software update to cause problems that could potentially halt operations. So an entirely robotic workforce actually sounds risky. Aptronic has already locked in a partnership with Mercedes-Benz to automate some of the most physically demanding and repetitive tasks on their assembly lines, which fits Aptronic's short-term goals of deploying their robots in commercial spaces, but their long-term goal is a general-purpose robot for the home, costing less than the price of a new car, capable of everything from cooking and cleaning to caring for the elderly. So how exactly are these companies training these robots to do all of these things? It's safe to say that the robotics industry would not be where it is today if it weren't for the recent advancements in artificial intelligence which has resulted in tools that have absolutely supercharged the training of these robots. In March, NVIDIA announced Project Groot, a foundational platform for training humanoid robots through text, voice, video, and human demonstration. This tool translates human movements in video into real-world movements in robots. Additionally, NVIDIA offers a simulation space called Isaac Sim where developers can infinitely simulate real-world scenarios to train and refine movements even further. So with this suite of tools, all a company would need to do is map out their current layout to create a digital twin of their facility. From there, they can feed in video demonstrations of how tasks are carried out, and then the developers can simulate their robots carrying out that task inside of the simulation space. Anything you can simulate in this virtual space can be translated to the real world. That's as plug and play as it gets, which explains why these companies are so excited about a robot future. Absolutely no reason to worry about job training, health benefits, or vacation days. So where does that leave humans? This is the question that's posed to the CEOs of these robotics companies all the time. And after watching hours and hours of their interviews, I can tell you that they're pretty much sticking to the same script. Brett Adcock, the CEO of Figure AI, sees their robots being put to use in manufacturing, warehousing, and retail. Where, quote, labor shortages are the most severe. This is their main talking point, that they aren't making these robots to take jobs away from people, they're making these robots to fill jobs that people don't want, or at the very least, take away the least desirable aspect of someone's job. I think, you know, we're gonna be short millions of nurses. I think the stat is 13 million nurses globally by 2030. And so um, what Apollo can do is work with teams of people. Apollo is not necessarily going to be a nurse, but what it's going to do is it's going to aid a nurse. The question is, why don't we have people that want to be nurses anymore? And the reason we don't is because they get trained, they go to expensive school, and then 60% of their job is fetching things from the supply closet, cleaning soil bed linens, doing things that are not directly involved in patient care. And I think that is sort of an example to think about for how these robots are going to be in the future, where they're not necessarily going to take a job one-to-one. -one. The question is, what is driving people out of these industries? What don't they like about their work? And how can you pair a robot with a person so the robot does the worst part of the job, and then you can elevate people to do new types of work in new types of ways? In that interview, Jeff Cardenas also mentioned something that I see a lot of people discuss on the Futurology subreddit, 
which is the consequence of declining birth rates, which have been dropping in the U.S. and around the world for decades. To understand the consequence of this, we can look to a country like Japan, which is the world's oldest country in terms of the average age of its citizens. For years, the robotics companies in Japan have been developing robots to fill jobs that their declining population cannot sustain. Today, they're leading the world in integrating robots into daily life, from serving customers at cafes to caring for the elderly, both of which are understaffed sectors of the U.S. labor market. Developing these robots to fill gaps in labor, doing the work that poses a risk to human life, and eventually just making life easier for all of us sounds great. What worries me is that without proper policies and oversight, they won't stop there. And that the integration of these robots will outpace the speed at which people are able to pivot to a new career path. Okay, this is how I would define the game of robotics in 2024. Groups of highly skilled teams developing robots capable of carrying out as many human tasks as possible to serve large corporations. Corporations who are looking to address labor shortages without having to deal with the baggage of staffing people. These skilled teams will use the funds from investments and sales to work towards a product that will one day meet a mass consumer price point. These same consumers are now potentially facing the largest shift in the labor market since the personal computer. How long will it take these companies to deliver? And when they do, will the people most affected be able to adapt? Because at the end of the day, that's the game.